So, many people consider UX research as a hard sell. Um, what is that? Why is that, in your opinion? I think that UX research can be a hard sell because some organizations are, um, well, different organizations have different decision making styles, and I think a lot of organizations are um, kind of evidence based decision making organizations. So there's this sense that you have to kind of prove something conclusively for everybody to get behind it. Um, there are other kinds of organizations that are consensus based or some are software sort of based or technology based, but um, I think in general it's, it's a lot more common to find a place that requires sort of the evidence and the facts in order to get everyone to agree rather than a place where you can all sort of um, uh, agree that empathy is an important goal and that that's enough to kind of drive um, uh, a research plan and, uh, and potentially you know, to color your interpretations of the research outcomes. So, it's, I think it's just the nature of the kinds of places where we find ourselves working. So when I ask UX people who practice user research, what is their biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. I usually hear how hard it is to engage stakeholders with research. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what are your thoughts on mm -hmm. this? Um, I think it can be difficult to engage stakeholders with user research because uh, insight isn't necessarily framed as something that's actionable. Um, so you can tell really amazing stories and show really rich video clips and everybody sort of nods their heads and agrees that that's important, but then what are the implications of those things? And what do you do with that? And how does that sort of translate into a real roadmap? Um, so those, I think, are questions that you have to ask yourself as you're uh, making sense of the research findings. And for me, actually, I often find that the hardest part of, of user experience related research is actually that moment when you sort of step off the ledge from just sort of looking at raw data to turning it into uh, real m meaning and uh, synthesizing and making models out of that and then discussing kind of what the implications are. But it's a really essential step because um, that's essentially how you help other people understand what you're going to do with all these amazing empathetic insights that you've gathered. Tell me a story about a difficult stakeholders that you recently have and that you can share and it could be anonymized. <laughs> um, I, I, so one sort of difficult stakeholder situation that, that I kind of remember was really uh, was frustrating because the not because the stakeholder didn't get user research or, or sort of um, uh, think that it wouldn't be valuable, but because this particular stakeholder really wanted to use it to answer a question that user experience related research wasn't well situated to answer. I mean, in this case, uh, they really wanted to um, to break into a completely new user population and to kind of uh, help um, the, the service that they had uh, be used by uh, a user group that it turned out really was never going to be using that service because there were other services that were more appropriate for what they needed to do. So in planning and conducting the research, what, um, what I was driving hard for was to figure out who is actually a good candidate for using the service, who's using the service right now, and how can we understand through their behaviors and their needs how this can be sort of maximized. And this particular stakeholder really just wanted to go find that elusive white whale, basically, and, and do a lot of research with them. And that was um, that was a hard fight. And in the end, I think I kind of compromised just to, in order to um, to keep the project moving forward. But, but what happened was essentially that I shortchanged the amount of really meaningful insights we could have gotten about people who really do use this service every single day and who would have really benefited from the improvements that research uh, could have exposed. So I think... Um, who you do the research with really matters, and getting stakeholders to support uh, and agree <laughs> who you do the research with can be a, a tricky part, but an important part of the process. Um, I think you mentioned yesterday in, in one of our emails that uh, you had a discussion about that uh, in Adaptive Path mm -hmm. last week or something like that. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me what were the, uh, <laughs> what was the, the different about? sides? Yeah. yeah, just last week at Adaptive Path, we were talking about this question of how you can kind of get stakeholders to uh, buy in to doing uh, qual qualitative user research um, uh, projects. And the big question actually was the one that I hear all the time, which was how will this be meaningful uh, data if you only talk to you know, a dozen people? Um, how can that in any way give us real insights about big, broad groups of, of users? And the, the, the way the conversation kind of resolved itself internally at Adaptive Path, which is often how it does on projects that I'm on, is that um, qualitative user experience research is in a lot of ways about 
um, creating empathy and creating deep kind of rich understanding of um, of a user's needs and behaviors and not necessarily uh, uh, the best tool in all cases for getting kind of good broad almost survey level understanding of different sort of preferences and and uh, likes and dislikes and um, I think it doesn't have to be either or I think often we say, you know, qualitative or quantitative, but um, one of the things that we talked about in our discussion at Adaptive Path was that you can actually mix qualitative anecdotal insights with quantitative um, sort of more broad trend analysis and, and start to create really rich understanding of not only what is happening, which you get through the quantitative data, but also why it's happening, which you can often get through qualitative data. Um, imagine an in-house researcher um, who's always trying to identify research opportunities for, you know, that, that are very impactful. Mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend they do uh, to better identify such opportunities? Mm. I think uh, if there were, if for an in-house researcher who was trying to identify really impactful research opportunities, I would recommend that they start by getting to know their colleagues really well. I mean, I, I often think that sometimes um, taking someone out to lunch or buying them a cocktail and, and, and sort of talking with a colleague about what strategic initiatives they're working on or what things they're actually trying to ac accomplish in their job or what opportunities they see that they're not, um, that they think the organization isn't doing a really good job uh, of dealing with right now can, can be just the start of um, a whole host of ideas for where you can start to push products or explore certain opportunity areas. So I, I, I think this is sort of my, I'm a broken record about this, but I really feel like inter personal relationships with the team that you work with are where all good ideas <laughs> come from, and I think user research is actually no exception. Um, UX researchers sometimes experience a tension between conducting research they were asked to do, mm. um, for example, by a product manager, versus research uh, that they were not asked to do but think they should do. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on, on balancing this, this tension? This, yeah, this tension between researching the stuff that you know needs to be researched versus researching what everyone agrees you should be researching is, is tricky. I think um, I tend to, uh, how do I say this? I, I think it's really important actually to show that you're willing to do the work that people need you to do. So being willing to do the research study that maybe is not at the top of your list, but that everybody has broad support for right now or is giving broad support for right now is really important. And then figuring out what are the um, kind of quick guerrilla kind of uh, low fidelity ways of getting a little bit more in information in some of these other areas that aren't necessarily getting broad support yet. Um, so I, <laughs> this isn't much of an answer, but I would say do both. If you yeah, I, I think there there can often be a tension between um, balancing the work that you're asked to do versus the work that you want you want to do. And I, I, I think the best answer, honestly, is to do both if possible. I think you you build a lot of goodwill and trust and support by actually showing that you're interested and committed to doing the, the projects that the rest of the organization values. But you can also um, uh, kind of prepare people to be to to ask some of the questions that you suspect are going to be the most interesting if you do sort of quick quick uh, guerrilla sort of DIY kind of inquiries into certain areas and start to um, socialize what you find and you know and helping people realize there might be more opportunity there. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, deliverables, and this is the mm -hmm. last question. Okay. Um, many UX practitioners are always looking for creative deliverables that engage their stakeholders with research findings. Uh, what are some deliverables you found to be working well for you and your uh, clients or stakeholders? The deliverables that uh, that really work very effectively for me often are kind of the standard um, standard ones you might expect. I think video and, and particularly short sort of video outtakes they just there's no replacement for them uh, in terms of um, kind of just turning on that empathy gene in the in the minds of different stakeholders. Um, so it takes a little while to really make a good kind of outtakes video, but I feel like it's always time uh, well spent on a project. Um, other things that I've been doing a lot of lately are um, kind of treating the end point of research as an opportunity to do kind of a generative workshop with stakeholders and the whole kind of mixed team. Um, so rather than uh, just delivering kind of a report that says here's what we did and here's what we found and here are some implications for the design, um, 
talk about what we did and what we found and then invite everybody to storyboard or sketch or role play some different possibilities for what that could mean for the design. Um, in doing that, you, you get people to really think a little bit more creatively about what the research actually means and to engage perhaps a little bit more. And then it also, I think, works really effectively to kind of hinge from research into design and, and help people understand this is really sort of, this is going somewhere really tangible. All right. So uh, what are your thoughts on reports? Yeah, reports. Um, I <laughs> have not made a proper report in many years, I think. Um, I think uh, my, my concern, with, with, particularly with research reports, is that, that they don't get read because they seem dauntingly big. And um, that's not to say that there's not a ton of value in there, but I think just um, as in any <laughs> user experience problem, you need to think about who's going to be consuming it and the context in which they'll be consuming it. And I find more and more that you know, PowerPoint style kind of delivery of information just it tends to circulate more effectively throughout an organization and it tends to just um, be a little easier for people to consume. But um, it's not to say that there isn't a place for reports, <laughs> just you have, to, you have to shepherd them throughout the organization, make sure that they're actually getting some love and attention. All right, that's it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you.